evening, everyone. It's great to see you all, and um, glad that you came out. This is our second last time together in the Old Testament, and after that, we'll take a short break, and then we'll get right into the New Testament in, in module number three. And so, welcome. I hope you uh, enjoy the study of the prophets. Talking about the prophets, I want to share with you some thoughts from one of the prophets we'll be looking at tonight, a very, very well-known story. In fact, if I mention the name, your mind will definitely go all over the place in terms of knowing something about the story, the story of the prophet Jonah. And so, obviously, some Sunday school pictures pop into your mind, uh, and you have seen the pictures, and you may have even seen some uh, uh, cartoons or something similar to that. But the prophet Jonah is just a sample of the variety of different uh, material and messages that we find in the prophetic literature. In fact, I personally can never really appreciate God enough. Uh, we will never know God enough, and uh, fully not, not in this life. And um, just appreciate the way that God works in the world, and the way He works with different people, uh, including myself. And it's an encouragement for us as we read through the Bible to know that God operates in many different ways in the world and with His people. Jonah is no exception. I want to share some thoughts with you now, and then when we get to the book of Jonah, I may just cut that uh, shorter so as not to spend uh, another big chunk of time uh, talking about Jonah. What I really want to share with you is, uh, when you go to the book of Jonah, it's obviously different from some of the other prophetic literature because it's made up primarily of narrative. And so you don't have long oracles and long preaching sections in the book of Jonah, but you have the story of a prophet, one of the prophets told, um, and in the four chapters that we have in this book, chapter 2 is the only exception, and that is a psalm or a prayer, the prayer of Jonah while he is in the belly of the fish. What I want to highlight tonight really is, and I'll give you more of the background when we get to the book of Jonah, but what I want to highlight is the surprising message of the book of Jonah. You may think, well, I've, I've already figured it out. I've heard many messages or stories about Jonah. Uh, obviously, God sent Jonah to Nineveh, and therefore God wants us to go to the rest of the world. Now, although that's a theme that we find regularly in the Bible, and more specifically, we find that in the New Testament, I don't believe personally it is the primary focus of the book of Jonah. It is certainly one of the things that God wanted to have his people know, and that is that he blessed Abraham in order to bless the nations, something that somewhere along the line they lost the plot. Um, and here in Jonah, we have a good example of God probably emphasizing once again something about the need to be a blessing to other people, because it's all really about the grace of God. Uh, we find uh, the theme of the grace of God especially in the New Testament, and from a New Testament angle, we, we normally approach it from that angle, and that is God, by His grace, comes into this world. Uh, Jesus died for our sins, and by God's grace, and by God's grace alone, when we put our faith in Jesus, we are saved without us deserving that. And that is a very, very true theological, biblical theme that we find throughout the Scriptures, and more specifically in the New Testament. But here in the Old Testament, in the book of Jonah, is a wonderful, a marvelous story of grace, God's grace. The story takes you by surprise. If you were a Jewish audience tonight, and you um, backtrack and you live in, in the 700s before Christ, or 600s before Christ, and you were listening to the story, the story again and again will take you by surprise if you were a Jew, and I'm reading the story to you. And I'll start. It says, The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Nothing strange. It starts like any other story, or most other stories uh, that we find in the prophetic literature. Go to the great city of Nineveh. You would immediately sit up. Because you know that Nineveh is the capital city of the Assyrians, and they are... At the, at, at, at the time that, we, that Jonah lived, our biggest enemy. And so here God is sending a prophet to the city of the Ninevites and preach against it. 
and you would relax once again because at least Jonah is not sent to go and bless them, but to go and preach against it. And you would say, yes. I mean, just a second ago, you would say, no. Now you would say, yes. Go, Jonah. Go give it to them. Because its wickedness has come up before me, in verse 2. And then suddenly, and, and you, you would tick. You would say, yeah, God's right. You know, definitely they, they're wicked. In fact, the Assyrians were known for their wicked actions and acts when they attacked other nations. Come verse 3. But Jonah ran away from the Lord. And suddenly you would sit up and listen again. Because that's a very surprising story. You wouldn't find prophets saying no to God. I mean, they would argue a little bit. You would have Jeremiah saying, Lord, I'm too young. You would have an Isaiah say, Lord, I'm too sinful. But you certainly don't have blatant disobedience saying, I'm not going to listen to you, God. I'm going to go my own way. You wouldn't have that. And so that's another surprise. And so he headed for Tarshish, went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. And uh, after paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. And, and you would struggle in your heart to know where is the story going? I mean, how can this be? But more surprises are in store for us because the Lord sent a great wind on the sea. There's a violent storm and you find Jonah sleeping below deck and you find sailors and, and probably these are unsaved, uh, Gentile, non-Jewish kind of sailors. Uh, that is the way the story is told later on. And they are praying. They are praying to their gods. But Jonah is fast asleep. He doesn't even care. Now that, again, would take you by surprise. Because if you're in trouble, you want to approach your God. In fact, you want to approach the only true God. Jonah doesn't even do it. The sailors are showing him, by way of their example, how to really approach a crisis like that. And then, of course, the story goes how Jonah confesses to them. And uh, this is one of the key verses in, in chapter 1, verse 9. When they challenge Jonah eventually, he says, he answered, I'm a, I'm a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. Now that's a real surprise. Where is Jonah right now? He's on the ocean. What does he confess? God made the ocean. Whom is he running from? God. I mean, does it make any sense? And if you were the Jewish audience, you would say, mm, something has gone completely wrong in this guy's mind. He's trying to flee from a God who's, who's always and ever and everywhere present. How, can, how in the world can you do that? This terrified those sailors, and they said, What have you done? And they knew he was running away from the Lord. Verse 11, the sea got rougher, uh, and they say, What shall we do? And he says, Well, chuck me overboard. Now, you can interpret that two ways. One is, Jonah is coming up as the hero. He is Superman. You just chuck me overboard and you will be saved, sort of thing. Uh, really? I mean, is Jonah, when you read the rest of the story, is that really Jonah's attitude? I don't think so. I think Jonah is saying, well, in a final act of getting away from God, just chuck me overboard. Suicide is the best way out. I am not going to go to Nineveh. I mean, chew on that for a little bit. If you read the rest of the story, it's very evident that Jonah was definitely not a willing customer to go to Nineveh. Anyway, there's another surprise in store for us because the sailors decided not to do that. They decided to save Jonah and, and, and try and keep him alive. When it came to the point where they, they realized this is all over, they then said, well, you know, sorry Jonah, sorry God. They chuck him overboard and then they start worshiping God. They sacrifice to the very God that Jonah uh, didn't proclaim to them, but simply just acknowledged to them, this is the God whom he is serving. And then there's another bit of a surprise, and that is God saves him. Sends a big fish. Uh, by God's grace, I mean, chapter 1 already is just one, one big sign of grace. If I were God, I would have blotted out Jonah like you do an ant, like that, the moment he disobeyed. But God kept him alive. God held him on the ship. God sent a fish to swallow him. There's another surprise. He survives the, the fish uh, right, right down, down there in the belly. He then prays. It's not a massive prayer of repentance. Read it. It's a psalm that he quotes probably. Not a massive, Lord, I'm wrong, and I'll go willingly and everything like that. That's not what the psalm is really about. 
but it is a prayer, and it does acknowledge God. And so the story actually starts all over again in chapter 3. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah for a second time, go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. So Jonah goes off. He's an unwilling um, um, prophet, but he does go this time. I mean, you, you can't now say no anymore because God's going to zap you and take you to Nineveh anyway, whichever way. And he does go. He doesn't go on a preaching mission, you know, unless you repent uh, and please repent because there is grace of God. No, just one single little line, God's going to destroy you in 40 days, and he walks right through the city. That's the, the only thing he says. And somehow, surprise, surprise to the Jewish audience, the bunch of Assyrian Ninevites listen. They hear the word of God. They repent in sackcloth, and they sit and they say, God, maybe, maybe there is, there is grace somewhere. And God hears, hears them. And that is a consistent a consistent response on the part of God. Every time people repent, God listens. And God changes His mind by not sending the destruction. And that's how chapter 3 ends. Now, Jonah then, of course, goes home and he announces to the rest of his people, I have been on a very successful mission. I preached and so many people came to know the Lord. No, no, you know the story better than that. Chapter 4 actually is another Massive surprise. Is Jonah happy that the Assyrians turned around, repented, and came to the Lord? No. He goes out, he sits on a hill, just in case God actually does destroy him. And when God didn't, he is angry. He says, God, this is... He says that to God. This is the reason I didn't want to come to Nineveh in the first instance. Because I knew that you are merciful. I knew that. I don't want the Assyrians to be saved. If you read the story, you'll see it. That's exactly what Jonah says. And that's the back and forth about this thing. So ultimately, I believe, when you read the story, it is about God and His grace. By not blotting out or uh, pushing Jonah out of the scene, by not destroying the Ninevites, and by not actually rejecting his prophet when his prophet had this massive argument with him. But God entered into, this, into the discussion, and the book ends fairly abruptly, almost, almost in a strange way. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this vine, and that's about the tree or some plant that grew over uh, Jonah, and it was taken away again the next day. Though you did not tend it or make it grow, that's by the grace of God. You had a plant, a, a bit of shadow over your head. By my grace, you had it over you. And you didn't do anything for that. You didn't deserve that plant. I gave it to you. When I took it away, this is the Job story, by the way. When I took it away, you had no reason to complain about that because you didn't deserve it in the first instance. It sprang up overnight. It died overnight. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left. And many cattle as well. Should I not be concerned about that great city? End of book really is a great story. I can go on and on and, and, and preach about it, which I'm just about doing anyway, but um, I, I really believe it's a wonderful story when you read it and you study it from a different kind of angle, uh, rather than just seeing one person going on a mission. It wasn't a, a willing missionary. It's actually more about God's struggle with His own people, Israel, and their unwillingness to share what they have been given with the nations. When God called Abraham, he said, I want to make you a blessing to the nations. And they have failed in their task. Now, we can point a finger, and I, I, would, I think we'd be wrong in pointing fingers. We can, we can acknowledge some of the wrong that they've done. The reality is, God has sent us on a mission, and God has blessed you and I. If we are Christians, and He's blessed this church in this world, so that we can be a blessing to the nations. And so we have a task, and that is to bless those around us. Individually, we need to ask that question. Am I a blessing? Am I a blessing to my family? Am I a blessing to my friends, my colleagues? Are we as a church a blessing to this community? Or are we sitting on the grace of God, claiming it for ourselves? We don't want other people to have part of this. We're saved, we're going to heaven, and... Um, the rest can go to hell sort of uh, attitude. We, we will never say it, 
but by not going out there and blessing the world around us. In a certain sense, we say it's okay for you to go to hell. I am going to heaven, and I'm happy about it. Let's pray together after that sermon of mine, and then we'll get into the lecture stuff for this evening. We thank you, Lord, for giving us an opportunity to learn, to study your word. We thank you for so many wonderful stories in the Bible. The one of Jonah that we just read, follow, following um, up from there, we know that Jesus came into this world and that he died for our sins, which is the biggest uh, sign and proof of God's grace ever. Thank you that you have graced us, Lord, that you have given us your grace and that you have forgiven us our sins, and that we belong to you. And I pray that you would help us as we journey further through the prophets, that we will be challenged in terms of our own faith and our own relationship with you. Bless us therefore tonight, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Right, as we look back, we have looked at the major prophets, um, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel and Daniel, and we finished that last week, taking us all the way to 538, roughly, uh, with the rise of the Assyrian of the Persian Empire. And then we started our journey through the minor prophets. We've only done two of them last week, and we should have done uh, Amos and Obadiah as well, but we'll look at that uh, tonight as we continue our journey. And then just to remind you once again, on a timeline, there is a sort of a general progression, but we will be jumping back and forth on a timeline, going back to the 8th century, and then we, we're uh, further down the line again, as we have already seen, and we're into the 6th century. So we're kind of moving around on a two-year span on that uh, timeline. And so tonight we will be looking at uh, Amos and Obadiah. We'll look at Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, and if time allows, we'll also do uh, Zephaniah. Uh, a chronological order of the prophets, we are jumping around on the timeline, but if you do them chronologically and give and take one or two changes on a, uh, a scale, perhaps you may have Joel, and Joel could be in the early 9th century all the way into the 8th century. Uh, he does not give us any indication, as I said uh, last week, uh, where he actually fits in, but he can also be in the 6th century, 580 or even later than that. The other prophets are, are easier to plot, and the one is uh, Amos. We'll look at him tonight, 760. And then Jonah, roughly about the same time. Certainly, um, it must be before uh, 612. We'll look at that later on, and um, probably uh, slightly later, I would say. And then Hosea, 760 to 722. Uh, that's about the time of the fall of Samaria. And then we have Micah, Isaiah, Nahum, Zephaniah, uh, all ministering uh, to the southern uh, kingdom in that uh, last period uh, of the southern kingdom. Jeremiah lived through the fall of Jerusalem, 626, all the way to 580. And then Habakkuk, 630 to 605. We'll look at him later on. And then Daniel. Uh, and Daniel lives in uh, Babylon, and he was taken into captivity from about 605, and he lived all the way to 538 at least, uh, if not later. And then Ezekiel also in captivity. Obadiah, um, and we'll look at Obadiah later on. Um, but he uh, is in the southern kingdom, but is round, uh, around the time of the fall of Jerusalem. That he has something to say about the Edomites. And then Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. They are at the return, the, the time of the return from the exile. And uh, especially Haggai and Zechariah are the ones who encourage the rebuilding of the temple, and Malachi seems to minister at the time when the temple was already uh, rebuilt. So if you study the prophets in this particular order, then um, you will do a sort of a, a study of the prophets on a timeline uh, as they succeed one another. Uh, just to remind you again, uh, we are looking at the picture against the, the broader world picture. There's the Assyrian Empire, replaced by the Babylonian Empire, followed by the a Persian Empire, and um, in 722, when, when Samaria uh, uh, fell to the Assyrians, they came to an end, and then the focus is on the southern kingdom, and a couple of the prophets, two or three of them, focused on different nations uh, in that region. It leads us to Amos, 
and Amos has a message of judgment. He became a prophet, but he actually was a farmer and a shepherd and uh, became a prophet to the northern kingdom. And so that uh, puts him way back in the 8th century from about 770 to 750. Could have been a short preaching excursion, um, so we're not sure exactly when he started and when he finished, but that gives us a broad range of when he lived. Here is um, a picture of the site of Tekoa, uh, where there's ap absolutely nothing left at this stage, but you can see it's fairly a fair amount of desert sort of country, uh, and this is the area where Amos came from and where he was a farmer. His name means a burden bearer. He lived during the time of Hosea and Micah, so they were contemporaries, uh, but he was older and started his ministry before them. And the only really thing we know about him is what he provides us information about. Uh, and if we turn to uh, Amos, chapter 1, the words of Amos, one of the shepherds of Tekoa, what he saw concerning Israel two years before the earthquake, uh, uh, an earthquake that we cannot date anymore. But when Uzziah was king of Judah and Jeroboam son of Jehoash was the king of Israel. And as he went up to the north to go and preach, he came from the south, from Judah, and God called him to go to the northern kingdom to go and preach to them. Um, he was in a debate with uh, one of the prophets who said that you're a false prophet and don't come around here, go back to your own homeland. You're a, you're a Judean and we are Israelites. We're in the north here. We don't actually want you here. So Amos was in a bit of a debate and Amos answered Amaziah. He said, I was neither a prophet nor a prophet's son, but I was a shepherd, and I also took care of sycamore fig trees. But the Lord took me from tending the flock and said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. Now then, hear the word of the Lord. You say, Do not prophesy against Israel and stop preaching against the house of Isaac. Therefore, this is what the Lord says, Your wife will become a prostitute in the city, and your sons and daughters will fall by the sword, and so on. So Amos had some very harsh words to say against Amaziah, who was a prophet from the north, whereas he represented um, uh, the south. He was from a town called Tekoa that was about 16 kilometers south of, of Jerusalem in the kingdom of Judah. And apart from that, as I said, we don't know anything more about him. Uh, except that he was a farmer, he didn't aspire to be a prophet, he didn't claim to be a prophet, but God called him, and he went on this preaching excursion uh, to the north. And therefore, probably was a very unpopular person. I told you about the tensions between north and south. It goes all the way back to the settling in the land. We find bits and pieces of that in Saul and David, and when David became king, the north didn't want to follow, and then certainly when the two kingdoms split from that point on, there were... A few occasions where they were in cooperation with one another, even going to war with one another, uh, but primarily, or by and large, uh, the north and the south were enemies uh, of one another. When it comes to uh, the book, the, the, the written book, the prophet was called to what seems to have been that brief time in the north. Uh, he delivered his, mes his message in, in Bethel. And when you go back to 1 Kings chapter 12, you will find Jeroboam the first building some shrines, temples, if you wish, where the northern people could worship God rather than go to Jerusalem to go and worship. And so when Amos left, it seems like he went as far as, as uh, Bethel, which was in the south of the northern part, uh, the northern kingdom, and that's where he delivered these messages around that particular shrine or temple. And when and how his messages were penned uh, or written down for us, we have no idea, uh, but it was probably written during the same time or shortly after the ministry uh, of Amos. When it comes to the background, and uh, this is against um, the map here of Israel and Judah uh, once again, um, and you'll find uh, Jerusalem and Bethlehem, and then Tekoa just south of Bethlehem. So as I said, about 16 k's uh, south of Jerusalem. And he went not too far north uh, because right there where you see the name Israel, just underneath that, uh, so just as you cross the border into the northern kingdom, there was the city of Bethel where this shrine was, and Amos delivered his message. He ministered during the years, 750 to about 730 somewhere. It may have been a, a few months long, maybe a year, or maybe even shorter. We have no idea. Uh, but Uzziah was king of Judah, and Jeroboam II was king in Israel. 
It's possible that the disaster, the earthquake that he mentions to us in uh, chapter 1, verse 1, became a bit of a stimulant. Uh, in other words, God used, uh, as in the book of Joel, some kind of a natural disaster to, to get the attention of his own people. may just be that people were a bit more receptive, even seeking the face of the Lord. Maybe more of them came to the temple. I remember reading the story of 9-11, and the Sunday following 9-11, was one of the highest attendances in the USA for years and years. The moment there is a disaster, oftentimes people say, what is God saying? Who is God? Where is He? And can I find out more about God? And so maybe the earthquake uh, was one of those occasions when people were more receptive to hear the word of the Lord. Um, but during this time, both Uzziah and Jeroboam II were very, very successful kings. The Assyrians were on the back foot to a certain extent, um, and, and Jeroboam II, the northern king, took the opportunity of expanding the borders of Israel. And maybe there was complacency at the time. Uh, the wealthy got wealthier and the poor got poorer. Uh, we see some of that in the book of Amos actually is one of the major focuses and that is social ministry or social outreach or social justice in the land uh, where people have been exploited. And so that seems to be the case and God sent Amos to go and preach to the north about that. When you look at the outline of the book, in chapters 1 and 2 we have oracles against the nations and I will make a comment about that now. But it's interesting how Amos started with the nations around Israel. He didn't, he didn't jump in immediately and say, Israel is going to go to hell sort of stuff. Uh, he actually started by condemning the nations around. And I believe by doing so, he, he got a hearing. Because people sat up and listened and said, well, this southerner, we can hear his accent. He's obviously representing Judah. But here he is, and he's condemning Moab, and he's con condemning Amor, uh, um, Ammon, and he's condemning the Philistines and the Syrians and everybody else. Uh, perhaps he's got a message for us. But then he switches immediately, and there's a particular pattern and a rhythm that he's following in chapter 2, verse 4, and he then focuses on Israel. It's almost like he's narrowing the circle. And ultimately, he says, but God has something to say to you as well. God is not just condemning Judah. In fact, Judah is included. It's not just uh, the Philistines and Syrians and, uh, and the Ammonites and the Moabites and so on, uh, but it's also Israel. And then uh, for a long time, for a long section actually, he has uh, judgments against Israel. In chapters 3 to 6 is God's judgment on Israel, the reasons for those judgments, and then there's a lament for Israel because he's, he's already weeping for Israel because of their unrepentance. And then in chapter 7, 8, and 9, we have the destruction of, of Israel foreseen in five visions of destruction. And then in chapter 9 specifically, we have also the promise of restoration. You'll, you'll begin to pick up a pattern in the prophets, and that is condemnation, judgment, if there is no repentance. But, but somewhere there is a little bit of hope. And you'll find that theme coming through the prophets. And that hope... According to my, uh, para, my uh, sort of um, uh, design before, uh, obviously the prophets had something to say to their own generation, and that is, uh, if you repent, then God will save us. But there has always been a sort of a future element to the, the, the prophetic messages, and that is, God will restore, God will bring restoration. And primarily when there's repentance... But God has kept a little flame alive, almost. Um, and it's a theme that we find throughout the Old Testament, uh, that, that God is keeping the, the story alive, so that ultimately, in and through Jesus Christ, He would, he would uh, uh, fan that flame again, and Jesus would become the light of the world, born out of Israel at that particular time. The contents and the design, I've alluded to this already, but... Uh, Amos starts by speaking about Damascus, and that's the capital of the Syrians, the Philistines, the Edomites, Ammonites, Moabites, and then also Judah. And he has a particular poetic design with lines. If you count the lines, you can see how uh, he has a particular rhythm. And uh, maybe we need to read a few of those lines just to get uh, a sort of a feel for it. He says, the Lord roars from Zion in chapter uh, 1 verse 2 and thunders from Jerusalem. The pastures of the shepherds dry up. 
and the top of Carmel with us. And then he starts with this. He says, this is what the Lord says. For three sins of Damascus, even for four, I will not turn back my wrath. Because she threshed Gilead with sledges, having iron teeth, I will send fire upon the house of Hazael that will consume the fortresses of Ben-Hadad. I will break down the gate of Damascus. I will destroy the king who is in the valley of Aven and the one who holds the scepter in Beth Eden. The people of Aram or Aram will go into exile to Kerr, says the Lord. And so that brings to an end Damascus. Now you'll see the pattern again. This is what the Lord says, verse 6. For three sins of Gaza, this is the Philistines, for three sins of Gaza, even for four, I will not turn back my wrath because she took captive whole communities and sold them to Edom. Verse 9, this is what the Lord says, for three sins of Tyre, even for four, I will not turn back my wrath. And so the rhythm goes on. And there's a particular rhythm that he is following uh, condemning these other nations around Israel. And then all the way to Judah. And they would certainly have sat up to listen because here is a Judean proclaiming judgment also on the Judeans, on his own nation. And so by the time he reached the end of that, the, the circle is now very, very narrow. And then the very next thing, the Lord says something about Israel. And he, he says about, this is what the Lord says, chapter 2, verse 6. For three sins of Israel, even for four, I will, turn, I will not turn back my wrath. And then he goes on, and the rhythm is expanded. It's multiplied. So instead of just uh, four lines, for example, there would be 12 lines or eight lines. So it's double and more than double the amount of condemnation against Israel. But now Amos has the attention of the nation because he has spoken about all these nations around. And then chapter 7 to 9 include five visions that Amos saw regarding Israel, uh, their judgment as well as their restoration. And here it is where we have to then be very careful when we talk about the restoration of Israel. You can apply to the northern kingdom because that was the focus of Amos. Or we could say up to literally today, we're talking uh, 2,700 years later, we have not seen the northern kingdom per se being restored. So obviously there must be a more spiritual significance to the restoration of Israel. Uh, and that is the line that I'm talking about that God is following throughout the whole of the Old Testament, in fact, throughout the whole of the Bible. In terms of the purpose and the message of Amos, the Lord has seen the true nature of Israel's spiritual condition and decided to judge them. They, they had a, uh, an appearance of religiosity, but there was no relationship. Um, they would come and worship uh, or sacrifice in their temple or shrine or whatever, but they would turn around and beat up the poor, uh, not pay the laborers what they are worthy. And, and the list in Amos is actually quite long in terms of the social injustices in the community. And despite the condemnation um, that, that, that came through the messages preached by uh, Amos, there was still some hope uh, for the nation. And if you go to chapter 9, this is uh, almost becoming a pattern in most of the prophets speaking to either Judah or Israel. And that is that there is hope in the future. There is always a little light shining, as I said before, or there is a, a little branch. Uh, the tree has been chopped down, but there is an olive branch, and it will grow again. Uh, that's the message you find again and again towards the end. And uh, so that's the picture in chapter 9, verse 11. In that day, I will restore David's fallen tent. I will repair its broken places, restore its ruins, and build it uh, as it used to be so that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations that bear my name, declares the Lord. The days are coming, declares the Lord, verse 13, when the reaper will be overtaken by the plowman and the planter by the one treading grape, uh, grapes. A new wine will drip from the mountains and flow from all the hills, and I will bring back the exiled people of Israel. Some of the themes that we find, social justice, as I said, is at the core of Amos' message. And I'm not going to elaborate some more, um, but the leaders are living in paneled houses while the poor people are uh, destitute and, and uh, God does not see any uh, grace in, in terms of looking after the community. People are uh, exploiting the poor. Uh, 
And God is aware of that. And he said, ultimately, Israel will go into exile. The other um, major truth we find or theme in, in Amos is that your life must be in harmony with your confession of faith. It's one thing to stand in the church and sing on a Sunday uh, and to express our faith. Uh, it's another thing in the week to live out your faith. And God says th those two things need to be in harmony. Um, and, and that is what I pointed out already. Uh, people are there sacrificing on the Sabbath or whenever, but during the week they live as, as heathens just about. And God says that that is unacceptable. Uh, James and many other books in the New Testament pick up on the same theme. And more specifically James where he says your faith is seen by your action. Your actions prove your, your, your faith. Um, and he, even James has something to say about the widow uh, and the orphans. And part of our expression of our faith is to look after those people. Many other doctrinal themes uh, are emphasized in the book of Amos, such as God as creator, the mercy of God, sin and humanity, renewal. And then I suggest some passages that you can read. Uh, that first section uh, really reads like uh, poetic uh, material. And they make some very good, interesting reading stuff. Uh, if you read about the circle, the ever-enclosing uh, circle, as uh, Amos eventually targeted Israel uh, as his um, audience. Chapter 5, verse 18. Um, I told you that more and more we will pick up the theme of the day of the Lord. And uh, the Israelites or the Jews at the time believed that the day of the Lord is when, when God's going to come and restore them. God is going to bless them. That's the day of the Lord. And more and more the prophets saw the day of the Lord as doom. And the day of the Lord had multiple fulfillments as well. For Joel, it was uh, the disaster of the locusts. Um, and so uh, that already was fulfilled in a certain sense. But when Jesus came, it was also the day of the Lord. And the New Testament talks about the future day of the Lord when Jesus is going to come back. That's another day of the Lord. So the day of the Lord has multiple fulfillments and different meanings as well. For some, it's a day of blessing. For others, it will be a day of major condemnation. And in chapter 5, verse 18, Amos has something to say. Well, from that point on, actually, he says, Woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. Why do you long for the day of the Lord? That day will be darkness, not light. It will be as though a man fled from a lion only to meet a bear, and, and so he goes on. So Amos's interpretation of the day of the Lord is doom and, and condemnation. In chapter 7, the opposition to Amos, he tells us a story of Amaziah, another prophet from the northern region, and then we already started reading the restoration of Israel. Right, that's Amos. The next book in our Old Testament prophetic section is Obadiah. Obadiah has a message about, and perhaps even to, Edom, after they supported the fall of Jerusalem. So, uh, we're now fast-forwarding the story again on the timeline, and we leave Amos in 750 or so, and we're now uh, roughly about 586, and that is the fall of Jerusalem. Obadiah is one of the few exceptions in the Old Testament where the focus is not Israel or Judah, but actually the Edomites uh, as a nation. And in addressing the Edomites, the prophet Obadiah, Obadiah is actually not unique. Um, there are many other prophets who refer to these other nations. We've just looked at one in Amos. And um, Amos talks to, or about, rather, the Edomites. And uh, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Malachi, and Joel all had some things to say about the Edomites. But Obadiah focuses entirely on the Edomites. In terms of the prophet himself, his identity is unknown. Uh, all that we are told um, is the vision of Obadiah. This is what the Sovereign Lord says about Edom, and that is it. We don't have any more information about Obadiah. His, no, his name means a servant of Yahweh, and he came from Judah. And he responded to the way the Edomites supported the Babylonians when they destroyed Jerusalem. The Babylonians needed help wherever, if you were a, an empire and you moved across the world, you would need support wherever you would go. You need food, you need accommodation, you need to camp somewhere, and so you would rely on some local people to provide all of those things for you. And so they came to the Edomites, 
and lure them to support them in order to destroy the Jews or Jerusalem or and Jerusalem. And the Edomites agreed to that. And in return, the Babylonians actually gave some of the cities, some of the land of Judah to the Edomites. And so you can imagine the animosity and the response on the part of those Jews who saw all of this happening and realized that they have been destroyed by the Babylonians with the help of their neighbors with whom they have now lived for hundreds and hundreds of years. They were not always completely friendly, uh, but they certainly have been neighbors for a long period of time. And so when you go to the book of Obadiah, uh, you then really go to uh, a part of what is, what is today uh, Jordan. And in that, in that region, we also have Petra, the city of Petra, and here is a picture of one of those carved out buildings in, in solid rock. Uh, it's reddish kind of rock. Uh, and here is a tomb and temple of El Kazne and Petra in Edom that dates from the 4th century BC. Um, and, and we don't know too much about that. In fact, Petra was not known to the outside world for hundreds and hundreds of years until it was eventually discovered by some European. And today it is a, a very popular tourist attraction. But this is the shortest book in the Old Testament. It has 21 verses and only one chapter. It contains no information about the time or the circumstances. However, the information provided in the book is clearly around the fall of Jerusalem. And that's why we can place it around 586, 585, or shortly uh, thereafter around the devastation of Jerusalem. Now, when we talk about the Edomites... Uh, we probably need a bit of inf information about the background and the relationship between Edom and Israel stroke Judah. The Israelites and the Edomites were related through, es uh, through Jacob and Esau. They were the descendants of Esau. And so oftentimes in the Bible they would be called, uh, they would be called or referred to as Hor or the descendants of Hor or Seir or Esau. So those actually made up uh, the nation of Edom. Tensions between the two nations date from the time of, of Israel's exodus, and they wanted to approach Canaan by using the territory of Edom to get to Canaan, and the Edomites refused them entrance and passage through. And so from that time on, you read that in the book of Numbers tw uh, in, in chapter 20, uh, there, there was tension between these two nations. But during the time of David and Solomon, they formed part of the Israelite empire, the mini empire that I referred to earlier on, and uh, they were subject to uh, Israel and to David and Solomon, of course, and paying tribute to them. And then at some stage, Judah lost its foothold or its control over Edom, and Edom became uh, independent once again. And uh, as I said, the Babylonians uh, lured the Edomites to come and help them to destroy Jerusalem or to take Judah. On this particular map, it's maybe not exactly precise, um, but you will find the kingdom of Judah in, in the light green over there, and then all the way uh, to the south, and, and rather far down south, and then also towards the, uh, the eastern side, uh, southeastern side of the Dead Sea. Uh, that would have been, generally speaking, the region of Edom at that particular time. Modern day, uh, you're talking about uh, an area that is now shared between Israel and Jordan, the country of uh, Jordan. Some of the later uh, developments in Edom. Uh, Edom in the New Testament is known as Edomia, and actually the Herods came from Edomia. Herod the Great was an Edomite. He was, and he was, he, uh, it, he is called an Edomian, um, and it's a, a word related to that. But the Edomites, as a nation, actually ceased to exist sometime uh, around about the fifth century. They were invaded by Arab nations, and slowly but surely. The Edomites as a nation ceased to exist, and we don't know exactly when and how, uh, but that seems to be the story. Um, and a mixture of different nations then occupied the territory. In fact, Herod the Great came from even a mixed marriage. He was half Edomite, half Jew as well. And the Jews, of course, hated Herod the Great and the, the other Herods following. Uh, and today, they no longer exist as a nation, and so you can only read about their history, whatever is known about them. Here is a picture, if you can see it, of the Dead Sea in the front, uh, for, taken from the side of Israel, and uh, you have the reddish mountains, and the, the picture on this screen is not that clear, but the reddish mountains in the background. And the word Edom 
is related to the word red. Uh, and so uh, it has something to do with Esau. When he was born, he was sort of reddish and he, he received the name Esau. Uh, but also it's interesting that the whole Petra is fr made from sort of reddish kind of rock. And those mountains really look red when you look at them. Um, and there's a story that I copied from uh, Wikipedia. Um, the nation of Edom is known to have existed back in the 8th or the 9th century BC, and the Bible dates it back several centuries further. Recent archaeological evidence may indicate an Edomite nation as long ago as the 11th century BC, but the topic is controversial. The nation ceased to exist with the Jewish and Roman uh, wars. Now, they placed this, the uh, existence or the last of the Edomites much later than even some other people do. So there's a lot of uncertainty about when the Edomites actually came to uh, uh, no longer exist. The book can simply be divided into two uh, sections. There's chapters, not chapter, verses 1 to 14, and that's the Lord's message against Edom. And again, in the last section of the book, we pick up this theme of the day of the Lord. And um, it says in verse 15, The day of the Lord is near for all nations. As you have done, it will be done to you. Your deeds will return upon your head. Just as you drank on my holy hill, so all the nations will drink continually. They will drink and drink and be as if they had never been. But on Mount Zion will be deliverance. It will be holy and the house of Jacob will possess its inheritance. Uh, what we need to understand about Obadiah is that it is a reminder of God's control over the nations. So uh, God is ultimately in control. It may not look like it, and we'll pick up some of this exact same theme as we go along. Uh, and especially when, when the Jews or the Jewish nation is, is overrun by either the Babylonians or later the Greeks or whatever, the question is, where is God? Is God actually in control? Why is God allowing this? And they needed confirmation that God is ultimately in control. It may not look like that now. In fact, I may never see it in my own generation necessarily. But I need to exercise faith in God who is ultimately in control. Hebrews 11 is a great chapter of faith. And it talks about people who have had major victories. But it also talks about people who have had major uh, persecution to the point of being sawed in two. In fact, those people died uh, because they believed in God. They never saw the day of the Lord as arriving and the return of Jesus or anything like that. But they believed. And that's the point of Hebrews 11. They believed in God. And that is what we need to understand. God is in control. And the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple devastated the Jews. We've seen that in Jeremiah as well as in the book of Lamentations. Uh, and, and Edom, a rival neighbor, assisted the enemy, and the Jews couldn't get over that. How can our neighbors assist our, our biggest enemies in doing so? But Obadiah, uh, and my belief is that Obadiah never really spoke to the Edomites. I don't think, like Jonah, he was sent to go and speak to the Edomites. I think it's a message of encouragement and comfort to the Jews, saying to them, God is in control, and he will deal with the Edomites in his own time. And in time, God did, actually, if you really come to think of it. Um, and so that was an encouragement uh, to them. And then Obadiah promises that the coming day of the Lord is a day when God will bring judgment on the wicked. He'll deal with the nations, but God will also bring delivery and restoration to those who believe in him and faithfully follow God. Some of the themes... Uh, pride is unacceptable. Uh, the Edomites uh, prided themselves in the fact that they have assisted the Babylonians. And God says, if you, if you um, uh, pride yourself in yourself, if you are, if you are proud uh, against God, then God will bring judgment on you. You can't get away with evil. Is another message we find. The Edomites thought that they were fine. Uh, God will not see what they do or what they did, uh, but you will reap what you sow. God's judgment is universal. Uh, it's not just the Jews as you see in, uh, or Judah as you see in Amos or Israel, but ultimately God will also judge the nations around. And then restoration is uh, something that is always a promise. And uh, interestingly enough, at the end of most of the prophetic books, there are, there are major sections or at least verses about the, the promised restoration somewhere in the future.
I don't have any highlights in the book of Obadiah apart from reading through all 21 verses. There's only one small, short little chapter uh, that you can read. Brings us to the book of Jonah, um, the prophet who refused to go to Nineveh. Uh, by way of introduction, the name Jonah um, is associated with the children's Bibles, as I said before, uh, but it contains a lot more uh, that we actually need to take note of. When it comes to the prophet uh, Jonah, we know obviously from the book of Jonah something about him, but it's interesting to note that in second chapter, in second Kings chapter 14, we have another reference to him, and this is what it says, and I'll, I'll start, I'll um, come in in verse 23. In the 15th year of Amaziah, son of Johash, king of Judah, Jero Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, king of Israel, became, became king in Samaria. And he reigned for 41 years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord and did not turn away from any of the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, which he had caused Israel to commit. He was the one who restored the boundaries of Israel from Lebo Hamath to the Sea of the Arabah, in accordance with the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, spoken through his servant Jonah, son of Amittai, the prophet from gath Hefer. The Lord had seen how bitterly everyone in Israel, whether slave or free, was suffering. There was no one to help them. And then uh, it goes on from there. So it sketches a bit of a picture, and there's one single reference to Jonah in the rest of the Bible. Uh, not, not really in the rest of the Bible. We have references to Jonah in the New Testament as well. But in the Old Testament, in terms of his historical background, it's very clear that he operated during the reign of King uh, Jeroboam II in Israel, in the north. Um, and this places the person Jonah towards the middle of the 8th century, about 760, um, and making him a contemporary of both Amos and Hosea. We don't know anything more about him, um, but that God has used him. He must have had a, a reputation of being a prophet. Uh, but we don't know whether he was seen as a prophet, but over here in Second Kings, he certainly had a prophetic ministry, and God used him to go to Nineveh. On a map, uh, it is interesting maybe just to look at the, the difference, uh, the distance rather, when you have Jerusalem over here um, on the Mediterranean Ocean, you go all the way across the, um, the Fertile Crescent, and then Nineveh is right here on the top over here. Uh, Babylon uh, is down here. So that just gives you a bit of a picture. And Nineveh was the capital city uh, of the Assyrians. In terms of his background, uh, during the time of Jeroboam, I said that before, there was a bit of a lull in the uh, Assyrians. They experienced a, uh, a sort of a setback at the time. They were a bit quiet. Uh, but by the time Jero Jeroboam II, the, the uh, he was able to push back some of the enemy and expand uh, the territory of Israel once again. And that may have caused a bit of a, uh, a reluctance to, to see some of the enemy or to even see their purpose in this world as Israelites or as Jews. Uh, and the Lord used Jonah uh, to go and preach a message to the Ninevites. Um, and, and one of the questions we obviously also need to ask is, was the focus Nineveh or was the focus the Jews, the Israelites? Now, my personal belief would be the focus was really the Israelites, because that's what the story of Jonah, the way I told it to you before, I believe that is the focus of the book. Um, I'm not saying that Jonah didn't go to Nineveh and that the Ninevites uh, didn't come to repentance. I believe they did, but that was not the primary focus. I think the primary focus was to help Israel understand their purpose in this world, something they have lost uh, over time. When it comes to the contents of Jonah, uh, there are four chapters. Chapter 1 tells us the story of Jonah fleeing and then on the shipwreck and so on, or the, at least a storm on the ocean. Chapter 2 is Jonah's prayer, reads like a psalm. Uh, in fact, there are many comparisons between that particular psalm and some of the psalms that you have in our book of the psalms. In chapter 3, Jonah does go to Nineveh. The Ninevites come to repentance. There's a major revival and a turnaround. And chapter 4 is about Jonah's response and anger to God. Uh, as I said before, I think Jonah can really only be understood when you, when you listen to the story of God and Jonah, where Jonah represents Israel. Israel was sent with a mission into this world, but Israel lost it. 
Jonah represents Israel. And God is now talking to Israel through Jonah by showing them His grace and how far His grace really extends. So both Jonah and Nineveh are in need of God's undeserved grace. So I believe that God's grace is the major theme in the book of Jonah. The biggest lesson is that God is merciful and He can, in fact He will, bestow grace on anyone of His choosing in His own sovereign way. And when people repent, God bestows His grace on them. God showed His grace to a disobedient prophet, um, to unbelieving sailors, and to a repentant Nineveh. The Ninevites were known for the disregard of human life. Their stories told in extra-biblical literature um, about them coming in, taking women and babies and, and literally smashing them against rocks and all sorts of atrocities that they committed. And God was, uh, was angry at them and He said, I saw their wickedness, their wickedness is before me and I am going to destroy them. Now the interesting thing is that God always consistently changes His mind when people really come in repentance to God. Um, and so that's the one consistent thing in the Bible that we have. In that sense, God is unchanging. God is unchanging in changing His mind when people repent. Again, think about that statement for a little bit. Some of the themes we find in, uh, in Jonah, God's grace is overflowing. God's grace is undeserved. The Lord seeks repentance. Uh, serving God is a matter of the heart. It's not a ritual thing. And then also, uh, God allows interaction with Himself. God, in chapter 4, for example, um, as I said, if I were God, I would have zapped Jonah a long time ago. I would have wiped him out. But God doesn't, didn't, and, and God still doesn't. And God invites interaction. And therefore, God entered into this debate with Jonah. Instead of just pushing him aside, He actually allows Jonah to speak to him, even to... Uh, to complain uh, to God. We, saw the, we see the same story in Job, and we'll pick up more of that when we go to some of the other uh, prophets as well. When you read the book of Jonah, um, I've mentioned the out-of-ordinary surprises that you find in the book, that God cares about enemies, um, that a prophet blatantly disobeys God, uh, that uh, the sailors actually become an example to Jonah himself, and that he and Nineveh are saved by God's grace. And then no particular section I want to highlight in terms of your reading. Uh, I think it's a book that you should really just go and read uh, the whole of the book, all four chapters, because it will speak to you. Right, that's the book of Jonah. Before we get into the book of Micah, let's go and take a, a bit of a tea break. Right, we're in the book of Micah. Um, and we are not far from the time of Jonah. But when you look at um, Micah, who guides the Judean kings through the Assyrian threat, then um, you know that, we, that Micah lives through the fall of Samaria. But his focus is on the south, primarily, although he does mention the north. In terms of the prophet Micah, his name that can be translated as, Who is like Yahweh, uh, was a contemporary of Isaiah of Hosea as well as Amos. And just by the way, when I refer to the meaning of a prophet's name, um, it, it may just be per chance that a person was given this name, he grew up with a name, and it was a very, very common thing to name a person with some kind of a link with God's name, either El or Yah, which is for Yahweh. And some, in the judges even, you will find people with the name Baal even attached to their name. So that could be of no significance whatsoever. Uh, it is just maybe for interest that we, uh, that we look at that. Sometimes uh, a person has been given a name. We know that Jesus' name was given uh, to Mary even before he was born. And so in that sense, the name becomes the character of the person. Uh, Micah came from a small town by the name of Morasheth, which was west of Jerusalem in the hill country of Judea. And although he ministers primarily to the south, he does mention the north or Samaria, because up to this point in time, especially before 722, Samaria was still in existence and the country still functioning. Um, and there's an interesting reference to the book or to Micah the prophet uh, in the book of Jeremiah. 
And now we need to turn to Jeremiah. And in your timeline, what you need to remember is that Jeremiah lives uh, 150 years later, sort of thing. Uh, if Micah lives in 750 or 740, then Jeremiah lived in 586 during the fall of Jerusalem. Jeremiah had many, many different things to say to the kings in Jerusalem or the king in Jerusalem about handing them over, uh, about God punishing them. This is a sign that the Babylonians out there is God's way of punishing us, etc., etc. And the people complained vehemently. There were prophets who said, Jeremiah is a false prophet. And so when you turn to chapter 26 of Jeremiah, and we're now 150, 170 years later, Jeremiah is threatened with death, is the heading of chapter 26 and verse 16. Then the officials and all the people said to the priests and the prophets, This man should not be sentenced to death, meaning Jeremiah. He has spoken to us in the name of the Lord our God. Some of the elders of the land stepped forward and said to the entire assembly of people, Micah of Morasheth prophesied in the days of Hezekiah, king of Judah. He told all the people of Judah, this is what the Lord Almighty says. And then they quote from the book of Micah. And they say, Zion will be plowed like a field. Jerusalem will be a heap, become a heap of rubble. The temple hill a mound overgrown with thickets. And then the elders respond now again. They say, did Hezekiah, king of Judah, or anyone else in Judah put him, Micah, to death? Did not Hezekiah fear the Lord and seek his favor? And did not the Lord relent so that he did not bring the disaster he pronounced against them? We are about to bring a terrible disaster on ourselves uh, and so on. So the, the point is that 150 years later, the book of Micah was already known and Micah is quoted by some of the elders to try and save the life of Jeremiah. Some people wanted to put Jeremiah to death because of what he preached. Uh, here is an aerial view of Morasheth Gath. Uh, it's also called Tel Goded. And you can see a sort of a mountain there. It's, it's been excavated, but not extensively so. So you can still see a mountain. Um, and one of the things that I read on this particular website is that uh, some of the locals there are very concerned because people come with quad bikes and they, they run up and down this hill uh, as part of the exercises. And they are concerned that some of the uh, artifacts underneath the soil will be damaged if, uh, if they don't take care of them properly. It is highly likely that Micah's prophecies were written down during his own time. Uh, he certainly made an impact, and 100, 150 years later he was well known. Uh, there are scholars who question or query some of the contents of Micah, uh, but there is no need for us to not believe that Micah himself or prophets around him wrote down the material and that became well known uh, in his time and, uh, and beyond. Uh, in the background, again, you will see ruins of Samaria, the city of Samaria. And Micah had certain things to say about Samaria, although, as I said, his focus was on Judah. The political and economic situation uh, was one of success. Uzziah was very successful in Judah, and Jeroboam was very successful up north. Um, and it brought luxury to some, poverty to others and uh, total complacency in the society. And, and Micah addressed these condi conditions in some of his oracles. Uh, if you turn to the book of Micah, once again in chapter 2, he says, Woe to those who plan iniquity, to those who plot evil on their beds. At morning's light they, they carry it out because it is in their power to do so. They covet fields and seize them and houses and take them. They defraud a man of his home, a fellow man of his inheritance. Therefore, the Lord says, I'm planning disaster against this people from which you cannot save yourselves. You will no longer walk proudly, for it will be a time of calamity. And so the picture is of people lying, wealthy people lying, planning and plotting, and then they go the next day and they grab this land grab. Um, and it sounds like some of our northern countries around us here, or, or country, or some countries just north of us. Uh, but they grab the land and they become wealthier uh, and they exploit the poor. And uh, these are uh, people living in Judah, so it's not even the people in the north uh, that he's addressing. Uh, but there is the Assyrian assault. The Assyrians are now a mighty nation and they are on the scene and they're moving across 
and obviously they, they're heading towards Egypt. Uh, and in that process, ultimately, Samaria was taken. And at that time, if you go back to Kings and Chronicles, they threatened to take Jerusalem as well. God helped them through uh, Hezekiah and others, and they turned around and they went back home. So they never took Jerusalem. But Micah had the opportunity to interpret the political events around them as God's operations, God working, God bringing judgment uh, on the nation. And that happened um, at that time that the Assyrians uh, actually took or besieged the city of Lachish. And on the screen, uh, there is a mound, a tell, uh, and it's the tell of the old city of Lachish. And Lachish uh, was located in the Shephelah Valley, about 48 kilometers southwest of Jerusalem, about 24 kilometers west of Hebron. The location was identified by a very well-known Old Testament scholar and archaeologist, uh, W.F. Albright, in, in um, 1929. And then they did some excavations there. Um, and that happened on several occasions, um, I, uh, either by Christian archaeologists or uh, by Tel Aviv University later on. And uh, Lachish was generally regarded as the second largest or most important city uh, after Jerusalem in the southern kingdom. And the Assyrians came, and as they came down, uh, pushing towards Egypt, they besieged Lachish, and at that particular time, they sent word to Hezekiah to say, once we are finished here, we are coming for you uh, as well uh, in Jerusalem. In the Bible, Lachish has a long history. It goes all the way back to Joshua, uh, Zanikarib in Second Chronicles 32. There's also reference in Jeremiah when uh, Nebuchadnezzar came and besieged Lachish once again. And so with Sennacherib here in Second Chronicles 32, we're talking about the circumstances that Micah uh, would have experienced at that particular time. Micah addressed three segments of the, of the society. There is the people in general in chapters 1 and 2. Then he changes his tone and he talks to the leaders of Judah and Israel, chapters 3 to 5. And then he talks to the whole nation in chapters 6 and 7. There is a well-developed structure in the book of Micah. Uh, each of the sections start with a call to listen. In chapter 1, for example, um, this is what we read. The word of the Lord that came to Micah of Moresheth during the reigns of Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, kings of Judah, the vision he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. And here's the call. So this is how he starts the section. Hear, O peoples, all of you, listen, O earth, all who are in it, that the sovereign Lord may witness against you the Lord from His holy temple. When you turn to chapter 3, he says, Then I said, Listen, you leaders of Jacob, you rulers of the house of Israel. And so he's talking to the leaders. And then when you turn to chapter 6, listen to what the Lord says. Stand up, plead your case before the mountains, let the hills hear. And uh, the general address is, Listen, hear, O mountains, the Lord's accusation. Listen. So there's a call to listen. That is followed up, if you read through the rest of those sections, uh, with judgment and condemnation. When you get to chapter 1, verse 3, for example, uh, he then goes on, he says, uh, the mountains melt, uh, he says in verse 3, look, the Lord is coming from His dwelling place. He comes down and treads the high places of the earth. The mountains melt beneath Him. The valleys split apart like wax before the fire, like water rushing down a slope. All this because of Jacob's transgression, because the sins of the house of Israel. What is Jacob's transgression? Is it not Samaria? What is Judah's high place? Is it not Jerusalem? And he goes on to condemn them. And then interestingly enough, every section, and he goes on for a couple of chapters, but then uh, it ends on a high note. In chapter 2, for example, in verse 12, uh, he, he says, I will surely gather all of you, O Jacob, I will surely bring together the remnant of Israel. I will bring them together like sheep in a pen. And uh, he has a promise of restoration. And this is the pattern that I, I referred to earlier on. Uh, there, there is sin in the land. God raises up a prophet. The prophet speaks into the situation, primarily judgment. And then there's the ray of hope. There is a little light shining. There's light at the end of the tunnel. That's the restoration. Always uh, there will be something that God is promising in the future. In terms of Micah's message and his purpose, uh, he states his purpose in chapter 3, verse 8, when he says, 
But as for me, I am filled with power, with the Spirit of the Lord, and with justice and might, to declare to Jacob his transgression, to Israel his sin. Hear this, you leaders of the house of Jacob and you rulers. And so he says, my, my purpose is to come and pronounce or announce judgment on the nation because, or the, the two nations because of their sin. There were those um, injustices that I referred to earlier on, poverty and rich, um, the uh, exploitation of the poor. Micah directed his judgment to the different sectors, um, and it seems like he's focusing on the worship centers like Jerusalem, where the temple is, and Samaria, uh, the capital city of the north to some extent. And then My Micah's message, message also includes hope, and that God will ultimately bring relief. The immediate threat is Assyria, and um, he said that God will ultimately bring relief. The relief didn't come for Samaria because Samaria was destroyed, but relief came for Judah and for Jerusalem when the Assyrians packed up and went uh, back home. And the prophet, just by way of uh, uh, an encouragement in chapter 7, verse 18, um, he says, Who is a God like you who pardons sin and forgives the transgressions or the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance? You do not stay angry forever, but the light to show mercy. You will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl all our iniquities in the depths of the sea. You will be true to Jacob and show mercy to Abraham as you pledged on oath to our fathers in days long ago. And that's how the book ends. It ends on the note of mercy and grace. Some of the themes that we find uh, in the book of Micah, um, and I have against the background there, uh, chapter 6, verse 8. Uh, it is a, a fairly well-known verse, and it says, He showed you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. It's a verse that we often quote, and I have actually preached from this particular passage. Uh, but Micah is leading the people to, to see that God wants their their, their faith, um, he wants their heart, but he also wants their lives. He wants their living on a day-to-day -day basis to show that they love the Lord. One theme that we find in the book is that God is the deliverer. He promises deliverance. He uses human beings. He may use a king. Uh, there is promise of a Messiah. Um, and there is sometimes even the enemy. And God can use the enemy. He can use the Assyrians. And we'll look at that a little bit later on when we uh, when we look at uh, uh, the struggle that people had that God can actually use enemies to bring about His purposes. And uh, we, we're going to look more of those, at those kind of arguments. But and then in uh, Micah chapter 5, verses 2 to 9, there really seems to be a reference to what I called multiple fulfillments. Uh, here we have a reference to uh, the New Testament and to the fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Uh, and in fact, it is quoted in Matthew chapter 2, verse 6, as a fulfillment of the coming of Jesus. And this is what it says, and you'll recognize this immediately. But you, Bethlehem Ephratah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come to, for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are for, of old, from ancient times. And therefore Israel will be abandoned until the time uh, she who is in labor gives birth and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they will live securely, for then he, these greatness will reach to the ends of the earth, and he will be their peace. And uh, uh, it's very easy for us to see how Jesus became the fulfillment of this particular saying. And whether he'd add immediate fulfillment in the time of Micah, we would no longer know. But we know from, uh, in retrospect and from the New Testament that Jesus became the fulfillment of that particular uh, uttering or oracle. And then God requires the heart to be in the right place. And I've said that already. I've read that passage to you in Micah chapter 6. Some of the passages that I encourage you to read is the imminent judgment in chapter 2. Chapter 4 verses 6 to 8 is about restoration. In chapter 5, I started reading that is about the new leader, uh, the one born in, in Bethlehem, 
And then chapter 6, verse 8, a, a life that pleases God. Verse 7, verse 7 is hope against despair. And then a God who forgives is a God of mercy and grace that you find in chapter 7, verses 18 to 20. Leads us to the book of Nahum, which is our next book uh, in the prophetic literature. An oracle concerning Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the El Cushite. Um, and that is the only introduction we have uh, in this book. The, the, the name Nahum means comfort or consolation. Again, whether his parents knew that and gave him the name, or whether his name was changed to mean that, we don't know. But certainly, prophetically speaking, uh, he, his whole message was to try and bring consolation to Jerusalem or to Judah. His book is a message of the destruction of Nineveh. And that would have been a message of consolation for the nations because the Assyrians were the ones who oppressed everybody uh, when you look at the Assyrian Empire at the time. The only thing we know about Nahum uh, is that he came from Alkosh. We don't even know where it is because the name of that particular city or place is never mentioned elsewhere. There are people who think that Nahum may have come from Capernaum because the word Capernaum Hebrew means the village of Nahum. And whether that is true or not, we have no means of establishing anymore. Uh, when we go to the book of Nahum, I want to show you this picture. It's, it's taken of a synagogue, the remains of a synagogue in Iraq. Uh, the remains of this quarter are in parts more than 2,000 years old. In the center of the synagogue, on the edge of the quarter, is a simple plaster tomb topped by a green silken coverlet. And this tomb is purportedly the tomb of Nahum his, himself. Now, whether that is true or not, we would not be able to establish. And unfortunately, when it comes to uh, Iraq and Iran, uh, excavations, archaeological excavations so on, are extremely difficult because of not only the danger, but because of um, not, not having a, a permission to actually go into most of those places to do the excavations. But the book opens with a word, an oracle concerning Nineveh. Nineveh is the capital city of the Assyrians, as I said many times. And it's the same city that we uh, found in the book of Jonah. So now we're into the book of Nahum. And Nahum had only judgment. There was no, there's no future restoration for the city of Nineveh. The Lord is jealous and avenging God. The Lord takes vengeance and is filled with wrath. The Lord takes vengeance on his foes and maintains his wrath against his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. The Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. His way is in the whirlwind, and the storm and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea. He makes all the rivers run dry. Bashan and Carmel wither, and blossoms of Lebanon fade. The mountains quake before him, and the hills melt away. The earth trembles in his presence. The world and all who live in it. Who can withstand his indignation? Who can endure his fierce anger? His wrath is poured out like, like fire. The rocks are shattered before him. And so he goes on to talk about uh, who this God is who is coming to judge. He then continues, The Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. But with an overwhelming flood, he will make an end of Nineveh. He will pursue his foes into darkness. And then he goes on to talk about how Nineveh will be destroyed ultimately. Uh, and that is a message perhaps not even for Nineveh, but mainly for Judah to tell them that God will ultimately take care of them. In terms of the writing, um, there is a, a psalm as he opens up the book. The psalm is written in poetic style. Some scholars have questioned this. It may be coming from someone else and not originating with Nahum, but we have no reason to, to support that. There are some similarities between Isaiah when you compare Nahum chapter 1 verse 15 with Isaiah chapter 52 verse 7. Uh, and it means that they either had a similar source or they shared a similar tradition. That is not unusual. They would have been in a similar training type school perhaps. And they would have, would have been relatively close in terms of ministry time. Uh, because we now fast forward the, the situation to the destruction of Nineveh. Um, when the Babylonians started rising up and they are appearing on the scene and that is the time when Jeremiah lived in Jerusalem and Nahum would have been uh, in the, uh, living in the same time. The city of Nineveh was destroyed in 612 
by the Babylonians. So this prophecy must predate that particular date. But in chapter 3, verse 8, there is another interesting reference. Um, and it says in chapter 3, verse 8, You are better than, are you better, is a question, are you better than Phoebus, situated on the Nile with water around her? The river was a defense, the water a wall. Cushion Egypt were her boundless strength. Put in Libya uh, were among her allies. Yet she was taken captive and went into exile. In other words, there is a, there is a reference to the destruction of the city of Thebes, or also called uh, No Amon uh, in Hebrew. And that happened in 663 BC. So already there's reference to the destruction of Thebes, but Nineveh is still in existence. So you have to then date the book of Nineveh somewhere between, or the prophecy of, of, of uh, Nahum, somewhere between 663 and 612 uh, BC during the reign of Josiah, probably. Here is a, a sort of a picture, a relief of uh, the king, uh, the Assyrian king Ashur Banipal, and he ruled from 669 to 627 before Christ. Nahum chapter 3 verse, verse 8 refers to the con conquest of Thebes for which uh, this Assyrian king Ashur Banipal was responsible. And that story is known from extra-biblical uh, literature. The background to Nahum. There are three major periods or time slots when the Assyrians uh, were dominating the world. Uh, we're not interested in the earlier ones because they really predate our um, major story in the Bible. Um, but our, our interest is in the third one, which is the so-called new Assyrian Empire under Tiglat Pileser III, Shalmaneser V, and Sargon. And uh, this particular empire reached its pinnacle in the 8th century and the first half of the 7th century. That is the time when they destroyed Samaria and the Northern Kingdom. Their wickedness and cruelty are well attested in the literature, uh, something that led to their ultimate destruction uh, as prophesied in Isaiah 14 and also in Zephaniah uh, chapter 2. Uh, something about the city of Nineveh, just in terms of background. Um, here is an interesting quote. I'm going to read part of that. It was Zennacherib who made Nineveh a truly magnificent city uh, in about 700 BC. He laid out new streets and squares and built within it uh, the famous palace without a rival, the plan of which has been mostly recovered and has overall dimensions about 210 by 200 meters. It comprised at least 80 rooms, many of which were lined with sculpture. There were a large number of tablets found in this palace through excavation, and those helped us to put together the history of the Assyrian uh, Empire. Um, and you can read the rest of that in terms of Nineveh, how big it was, how far it stretched uh, when it comes to the city uh, of Nineveh. Uh, against the background of an image of Tiglat Pileser III. He was the Assyrian king, also referred to in the scriptures by his Assyrian name, Pul or Pulu. Those are two names we find in the Bible, uh, but when you go to the historical records, he is known as Tiglat Pileser uh, III. And then it was known for its beautiful parks, magnificent palace, uh, as, as was shown by some of the excavations done. Um, and here's a quote from ChristianAnswers.net. This exceeding great city, quoting from Jonah, lay in the eastern or left bank of the river Tigris, along which it stretched for some 30 miles, having an average breadth of 10 miles or more from the river bank uh, back towards the eastern hills. This whole extensive space is now one immense area of ruins. And the picture that you need to have is probably of a city that was surrounded by wall, but outside the city more suburbs, if you wish. We would probably call them suburbs today, which ran up on the river Tigris for many miles. That may explain to us the three-day journey of the, of, of the prophet uh, Jonah that is mentioned in the book of Jonah, which obviously many scholars have found to be too much to believe. Uh, but if you look at the, the city of Nineveh as one stretched out area, perhaps, rather than uh, uh, maybe just one smaller city with, with a, a surrounding wall, uh, then you could understand that it would have taken a preaching journey three days to actually uh, do all of that. Uh, here is an outline of the city wall and the gates of Nineveh, as you can see, and I will mention, and, and, and the words in a moment will mention uh, 
Kuyunjik, uh, Kuyunjik, and then also Nivi Yunus uh, in a moment. So those two areas are two tells uh, that have, one has been excavated and the other one not. Today, Nineveh's location is marked by two large mounds, uh, Kuyunjik and Navi Yunus, which means Prophet Jonah, and the remains of the city walls about 12 kilometers in circumference. Uh, Kuyunjik has been extensively explored, but the other mount, Navi Yunus, has not been explored because there is a Muslim shrine dedicated to that prophet on the site. Uh, it's an interesting thing because it means that also Muslims recognize some of the Old Testament prophets, including the prophet Jonah. Uh, here on the screen you have a, a picture of some of those clay-type tablets, and it's quite extensively written. It's been deciphered, and one of the things that helped us to put together, well, when I say us, not that I did anything, uh, but uh, scholars were able to dig this up, and some of the tablets and things that were discovered that describe history, and uh, we know uh, quite a bit about Tiglat Pileser III. He was a prominent king of Assyria in the, the 8th century and widely regarded as a founder of the new Assyrian Empire, that third major empire of the Assyrians that I mentioned before. He's considered to be one of the most successful military commanders in world history, conquering most of the world known to the Assyrians before his death. And he's mentioned in 2 Kings chapter 15, verse 29, having captured the northern Israelite cities, and his Assyrian name I mentioned before was Pulu. His son Shalmaneser V is the one who captured Samaria and destroyed Samaria in 722. Here's another picture of a tablet, um, the Babylonian Chronicle, and it records events in ancient Babylon dating from about 750 to 280 B.C., so it's quite extensive description of a long period of history. This tablet is part of that chronicle and records events from 605 to 594. As I mentioned to you before, uh, several, many different tablets were discovered and they describe history as history goes along. And this particular one on the screen, the, the, the picture in the background, uh, dates from 605 to 594. And if you are sharp, you would have recognized the time just before the fall of Jerusalem. In fact, this is the time when the Babylonians came in and they subdued Judah in 605 and they did the same thing again in 597. And it includes a description of Nebuchadnezzar's campaigns uh, against Judah, against Egypt, uh, the, uh, uh, the conquering or the killing of Pharaoh Necho or the defeat of Pharaoh Necho in, in which battle uh, as Josiah tried to stop Pharaoh Necho, he was killed in that particular battle because he sided with the Babylonians and so on. But the background of that whole story is well known to us because of this particular description on this tablet. Some of the outline and the description in, in Nahum, it's a short book. It consists only of three sections. There is a psalm in, chapters, in chapter 1, verses 1 to 8. Uh, it's about God's control and uh, how God comes into this world to announce judgment. And then the doom of Nineveh. When you, when you start in chapter 1 verse 9 and you read to chapter 2 verse 2, it's all about God destroying uh, or pronouncing judgment on Nineveh. The future doom of Nineveh and the protection of Judah uh, would have brought comfort to the Judeans knowing that God is acting uh, on their behalf. And then the siege of Nineveh, chapter 2 verse 3 all the way uh, to the end of the book. The destruction of Nineveh is foretold, summarized in chapter 3, verse 5, by the words, Behold, I am against you. And he's talking about Nineveh. Nineveh, behold, I am against you, declares the Lord Almighty. Again, when we look at the purpose, um, it announces the damnation and the destruction of the Assyrians, uh, represented in their capital city of Nineveh. Uh, they were intended as a comfort for Judah. Um, I personally don't think the message was ever delivered to the Ninevites necessarily, but that it was meant for the comfort of Judah. So the Judeans would have heard this message. It may be that the message eventually got to Nineveh. We're not sure about that. Um, but behind this is again, and we see this again and again, the control of God. God is ultimately in control. Some of the themes... 
um, God is just and will punish evil. Uh, in much of the Old Testament, the Assyrian nation stands for evil. As Babylon picks up that same reputation in the New Testament. When you go to the book of Revelation, for example, then it's all about Babylon. And Babylon represents evil. Everything against God. And so, in the Old Testament, oftentimes Assyria uh, represents the evil. It's symbolic for everything evil uh, in this world. Nahum therefore announced their destruction. And by implication, the fact that God judges the nations or the enemies and He brings justice, justice and salvation to His people. When you look at Nahum and the prophecy about uh, Nineveh, it came into fulfillment after many revolts in the provinces um, around the world, very, very difficult to keep a, uh, an empire alive for more than two, three, or four hundred years or so, uh, as, as much as you may try, eventually there's going to be a rebellion somewhere. That happened in some of the provinces, and especially down in Babylon. Um, some Assyrian rebels took the city of Babylon. They again were, were overthrown by Babylonians themselves, and they started establishing the Babylonian Empire, and they pushed up north until they reached Nineveh, besieged it, and as I said before, in 612, the city of Nineveh was uh, destroyed. The Assyrian Empire began to show signs of weakness, and Nineveh was attacked by the Medes, who subsequently were joined by Babylonians and Susianians, um, and they attacked it, and it was razed to the ground, and Nineveh never really recovered from that. If you want to read something about Nahum, I'm suggesting the holy character of God. Uh, there is a well-known verse um, that is even quoted in the New Testament, and I, I have learned some songs about this. It says, The Lord has given a command concerning you, Nineveh. You have no descendants to bear your name. I will destroy the carved images and cast idols that are in the temple of your God. I will prepare your grave, uh, for you are vile. Look, there on the mountains are the feet of one who brings good news, who proclaims peace. Celebrate your festivals, O Judah, and fulfill your vows. No more will the wicked invade you. Because, uh, for, uh, will, uh, no more will the wicked invade you. They will be completely destroyed. Now, this is one of the reasons why I believe that Nahum was addressing the Judeans and not the Ninevites as such. He was giving comfort to Judah, that God is going to deal with the enemy, which is Assyria. Now, we get to Habakkuk, the book of Habakkuk, uh, a prophet who struggles to come to grips with the fact that God can use enemy to bring about His justice in this world. And uh, if you turn to the book of Habakkuk, chapter 1, verse 1 says, The oracle that Habakkuk the prophet received. And then he jumps straight into a conversation between Habakkuk and God. And much of the book is exactly about that. Um, you look at the background. Habakkuk lives during the time just before the destruction of Jerusalem. Um, and he has a major issue with God who doesn't act. Seems like Judah is living in sin. Uh, they're not doing what they should be doing. And uh, they're not serving God, and Habakkuk has a problem with that. And he actually addresses God. He says, God, how can you allow it? God comes back and he says, Habakkuk, I'm in control, so don't worry. I have raised up the Babylonians to bring punishment on my nation. And then Habakkuk has a grootskruk, and he says, but God, how can you use the unholy Babylonians, the sinners out there, to punish your people who are supposed to be holy. Yeah, I want them to be, uh, I, want the, I want justice to, to happen in, in our nation, but how can you use the sinners? And then God comes back to Habakkuk and he says, Habakkuk, I will ultimately also punish the Babylonians. So just hold on to your seat, as it were, because ultimately they are also going to be punished. I am fully in control. But Habakkuk really struggled over this whole issue of God using sinners out there to bring about His holy purposes. The book provides no details about the prophet or his time, but it's very clear that it is just before the Babylonians were on the rise. And so, uh, in sequence, it follows well on Nahum, because the Assyrians 
were overtaken by the Babylonians. The Babylonians are on the scene, and shortly thereafter, 612, the uh, Nineveh fell. And if you fast forward just a few years, you're into 605, then in 597, and then again in 586, when Jerusalem ultimately was destroyed by those very same Babylonians. And so Habakkuk sees that picture. God is giving him that bit of a picture into uh, the future. And so his ministry would be roughly around 603, uh, 630 rather, all the way to about 605 uh, or, or, or thereabouts. When it comes to his background, uh, I've mentioned most of this already. Um, by 627, the city of Babylon was seized by Assyrian rebels. They were overtaken by Chaldeans. That's the biblical word for Babylonians uh, in 626. And then the Assyrian Empire was on the downhill side and the Babylonians took that over. The book of Habakkuk contains three major discourses or conversations, each consisting of Habakkuk talking to God, let's call it prayer, and then God responding to Habakkuk, talking to Habakkuk, uh, and responding to his prayer or his concern. Habakkuk prays about the situation in Judah. In fact, this is the way it goes. How long, O Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Uh, does that sound familiar? Uh, many of us have been here. How long, O Lord, I call, but there's no answer? He's essentially saying, why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife. Conflict abounds. Therefore the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous so that justice is perverted. And now the Lord is answering and the NIV has actually given us the heading so it, it helps us to know who is speaking because it doesn't necessarily say so in the text. The Lord is saying, look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed, for I am going to do something in your days that you would not believe, even if you were told. Here's one of those promise box verses that I referred to before. Have you received an SMS where someone says, I just want to encourage you. The Lord is saying to you, uh, for I am going to do something in your days that you would not believe, even if you were told. The Lord is going to bless you. Actually, no. Not what it says here. Go to the next verse. I am raising up the Babylonians, that ruthless and impetuous people, to sweep across the whole earth, to seize dwelling places not their own. They are a feared and dreaded people. They are a law to themselves and promote their own honor. Their horses are swifter than leopards, fiercer than wolves at dusk. Their cavalry, cavalry gallops headlong. Their horsemen come from afar. And, and so he goes on. And essentially God is saying to him, the, the major thing I'm going to do that you won't believe is I'm going to raise up the Babylonians to come and destroy you. So don't ever quote this verse out of context again. All right. Now Habakkuk responds, verse 12, O oh Lord, are you not from everlasting, my God, my Holy One? We will not die. O oh Lord, have you, dis have you appointed them to execute judgment? O oh rock, you have ordained them to punish. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. How can you, how can you allow an evil Babylonian nation to come and do this? You, surely, Lord, you can't allow that. The Lord comes back again. Then the Lord replied, Write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets. And, and he says, essentially, and I'm going to read all of that, but essentially saying, well, I'm going to deal with the Babylonians as well. And God did eventually, because they were overthrown by the Persians once again. And so God did deal with the Babylonians. So it's a back and forth between Habakkuk uh, and God. The message of Habakkuk is fairly plain against the background of evil in the land. Habakkuk wondered whether God is ever seeing the evil. God, I, I mean, I, lived, I have now lived for 30 years or 40 years. I'm only seeing evil. I don't see you act. When are you going to punish? God says, yes, I will punish through the Babylonians. Uh, Habakkuk is horrified that God can use the evil people to do so. And then God says, well, you know, I'm in control. The Babylonians will be my instruments, but ultimately because they are evil, I will also punish them because they are a wicked nation, and therefore they will have their time ultimately. 
apart from the little bit that we find in Jonah. Habakkuk is the only prophet who includes a, a full-blown discussion between God and a prophet. Most of the other times it's God revealing stuff and the prophet delivering the message. God revealing and the, the prophet delivering. But over here, like in Jonah chapter 4, we have an encounter between God and prophet. And so we have that um, bit of an insight into how God allows himself to be questioned and queried by a human being. The key to understanding Habakkuk lies in the responses of God, but like, like in the book of Job. But it's different from the book of Job because Job was never really given a, a reason. Job was taken on a tour of the universe. And Job needed to fall on his knees and say, God, you are massive, awesome, uh, beyond my understanding. But it's different than Habakkuk. God this time chose to show Habakkuk what he is doing. In fact, in detail. He told them about the Chaldeans. They will come and punish. Then he told them ultimately the Babylonians will uh, be destroyed. So he does give him some answers. When it comes to the structure of Habakkuk, we need to understand those prayers and God's responses to, uh, to Habakkuk. The prayers and responses evolve mo mo almost like a conversation, each time taking the next step, taking the conversation to a next level, as it were, or the argument. And then one of the keys that we need to understand in this book is uh, we find in chapter 2, verse 4. And it says, See, he is puffed up. His desires are not upright, but the righteous will live by his faith. And when you go to the book of Romans, this is a major central theme in Paul's argument where he says the righteous will live by faith. It is by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ we are saved. And that is the only way you will become righteous. And he quotes Habakkuk in this regard. And essentially it means that a person who believes in God will live a righteous life. The righteous is the one who believes in God. And by believing in God, you will then uh, live a life that is pleasing uh, to God. And that is really true faith. Because you may not understand how God is operating. You may see all the evil in the world. You may not even see justice done in your own life. But you continue to believe in God. It's all about faith. Which is why earlier I quoted um, Hebrews chapter 11. Because when you read through that chapter, it is clear that many of those people did not see the end result. All of them that are quoted, they never saw Jesus coming into this world. But they held on to a promise. They held on by faith to God. And that is essentially Paul's argument. We put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ who died for us. And on that basis, I am declared a righteous person. And then as a righteous person, I now live by faith my faith in God, and therefore it finds expression in the way that I impact the world around me. Some of the themes that we find in the book of Habakkuk, God is aware of the evil done, He is the final judge, and ultimately God is in control. In fact, if there is one message that we get in the prophets and the prophetic literature, is this one, God is in control. Some of the passages I suggest that we read uh, in the book of, of Habakkuk, um, there is a really, really wonderful statement. I call it blind faith uh, in chapter 3, verse 16. Just listen to this. I heard and my heart pounded. My lips quivered at the sound. At the sound, decay crept into my bones and my legs trembled. Yet, I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. That's the Babylonians. Then he says this, you've heard this before, Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vine, though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen, and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will be joyful in God my Savior. That is true faith. That is is true faith. You believe despite the fact that you don't see anything. There's no proof. There's no wealth. There's no health necessarily. But I hold on to my faith in God. That is what Habakkuk is essentially saying. And on that note, we will finish for today.
and we'll look at Zephaniah uh, and the rest of the Old Testament prophets next week. May the Lord bless you.